My name is Graeme Jones. I'm Professor of Rheumatology in Hobart, Tasmania, Australia. And what I'd like to share with you today are results of a poster I recently presented at the ULR Madrid meeting. This is uh, regarding the long-term efficacy and safety of tocilizumab monotherapy. The slides from this talk will be uh, available as a download PowerPoint set, which I'd encourage people to look at as they have all the uh, data in detail. So in the last 20 years, we've seen amazing, amazing advances in rheumatology. Uh, we've had advances in classification of disease from the old ACR classification that was based on long-standing disease, often with a lot of damage, through to the new updated uh, criteria from 2010, which really allow us to identify disease very accurately. Paralleling this, we've had major advances in treatment options, and we now have well in excess of 10 effective options for rheumatoid arthritis, including nine biologics. In the registries from around the world, it's clear that most patients are on combination therapy, that is, they're on a biologic plus or minus methotrexate or leflunamide most commonly, but up to a third of patients uh, in most countries, including the USA, Australia and Europe, are on monotherapy. And one of the reasons for this is unclear because most rheumatologists, when they're actually surveyed about this, say about one in 10 of their patients on monotherapy, because they know that with the TNF agents, uh, they work best when you combine with methotrexate or leflunamide. A couple of years ago, Andrew Taylor and I put together a review paper of all the monotherapy trials looking at ACR 20, 50 and 70 results for each of the biologic agents. And they're summarised on slide three of my accompanying slides, but I'll just run through them here for you. So on the left-hand side here, we have etanercept. Uh, and what we've got here is white is placebo, uh, black is biologic, light grey is methotrexate and dark grey is salatopyrin. You'll see for etanercept, etanercept is superior to placebo and salatopyrin, but in both ERA and TEMPO trials, it was no different to methotrexate when given as myotherapy. Similar, similar things are available for adalimumab. In the original van der Putte trial, it was superior to placebo, but in the Premier trial, methotrexate was numerically but not statistically superior to adalimumab monotherapy. Sertilizumab pegol is superior to placebo, but there's no trials comparing it to methotrexate. Galimumab, uh, is very similar to methotrexate in both go before and go forward. Tocilizumab in the Ambition trial was superior to methotrexate, and in the Satori trial done in Japan, it was vastly superior to methotrexate. But one needs to take into account that in the Satori trial, the maximum dose of methotrexate that could be used was 8 milligrams per week, which is much less than what we use in the West of 20 to 25 milligrams a week on average. A Bardacept from the Moreland trial looked like it was superior to methotrexate monotherapy, but I couldn't calculate p-values from this trial. And rituximab was superior to methotrexate for both ACR20 and ACR50. So we've got evidence that tocilizumab, rituximab, and possibly a Bardacept are better than methotrexate as monotherapy. Yet in my country, we have etanercept, adalimumab, and sertilizumab approved as monotherapy, and the bardacept and rituximab have to be given with methotrexate. So the approvals don't quite register, the, uh, don't quite reflect the actual evidence. If we go ahead then and then look at x-ray progression, what I've done here is calculate what's called a standardised mean difference, and a small standardised mean difference is 0.3, a moderate one, 0.5, and a large one, 0.8. And what we're looking at in this trial, is, in this meta-analysis, is the monotherapy versus methotrexate. So methotrexate itself is associated with a 0.36 effect. So each of these are in addition to methotrexate. So tocilizumab monotherapy adds 0.43 to methotrexate. So that's a large effect at 
atanercept and adalimumab at around 0.24 or 0.23, so they add up to a moderate effect overall, and gadolimumab had no effect on x-ray progression when used as monotherapy. So this data really suggests that tocilizumab, both for disease control and for x-ray progression, is superior as a monotherapy agent. Well, what about the long term? The only data that was available until recently was the STREAM study out of Japan where they followed people who took part in the original trials. And what you see with this study is the remission rate appears to peak around one to two years and gets to 55% by year five. And what's quite amazing for me from these particular study is that only one patient out of the 143 withdrew as a result of unsatisfactory response. And as a clinician, it's important to drop prednisone down. And in the STREAM study, 87% of patients were able to reduce their prednisone dose and 31% were able to stop altogether, uh, which to me is a pretty important outcome. So the AMBITION trial was a trial I was the chief investigator on. Uh, and this was a randomized, double-blind, double-blind, double-dummy, so I mean, multi-centre phase three study. And the objective was to evaluate the efficacy and safety of tocilizumab monotherapy versus methotrexate monotherapy in patients with active rheumatoid arthritis who had not previously failed methotrexate or biologic treatment. The study population for this was adults with moderate to severe rheumatoid of greater than three months duration, they had to have a swollen joint count greater than 6, tender joint count greater than 8, and a raised CRP and or ESR, and they weren't allowed to be on methotrexate or biologic therapy currently, although they were allowed to be on it in the past, but were not allowed to have failed due to lack of efficacy or serious toxicity. So the primary results are given on the next slide. And this had a rather convoluted statistical approach initially. It started off as a non-inferiority study in the per-protocol population, but then moved to an in a superiority analysis in the intention-to-treat population. You'll see that the per-protocol and intention-to-treat populations were very similar, and so the numbers give you very similar results. So tocilizumab was superior to methotrexate for ACR20, ACR50, and ACR70, but because a lot of patients in this study had relatively early disease, both drugs were really quite good. Methotrexate uh, had a 53% ACR20 compared to 70% for tocilizumab, for example. If we then go and look at the DAS remission rate, uh, at 24 weeks, methotrexate had a DAS remission of 12% and tocilizumab was 34%, but by 60 weeks in the open label, study, the remission rate was up to 50%, indicating increasing efficacy over time and really quite consistent with the results from the Lithe trial, which was double blind to 12 months and showed very similar results. So the aim of this long-term extension presented in the poster was to evaluate the efficacy and safety of tocilizumab monotherapy in patients from ambition who remained in the long-term extension study up to 240 weeks. So the next slide shows the retention of patients in this study. Now you note that Ambition as a whole had about 700 patients and only 243 patients entered the long-term extension. Generally, they were people who got tocilizumab in the first period and were doing well. So the remission rate in this group compared to the whole study was a bit higher at the start of the study. What we see over time is there's some dropout, but uh, I'm quite impressed by these figures because I'd prefer roughly a 10% dropout in a clinical trial per year. And what we see in this trial is that 66 patients out of 243 dropped out after almost five years. So that's quite low in terms of dropout rates. If we look at people Getting remission, the next slide shows what happens with both DAS remission, which includes the CRP, but also CDI remission, which doesn't. And what you see here is that remission rates continue to increase over time. 
and they look again to peak between one to two years. So what this suggests is that you may actually need a longer period of treatment to be sure this agent isn't going to work. The next slide looks at withdrawals from the study uh, in both patients on monotherapy and those patients who added DMARDs to their monotherapy over time. And what we see is that the majority reason for withdrawal was adverse event or illness. And so 10% of the monotherapy group withdrew because of adverse events. But surprisingly, it was 20% of the people who added in DMARDs. So adding in a DMARD didn't necessarily give better efficacy and led to a worse toxicity. Uh, a small number withdrew consent. And if you look at patients who withdrew because of insufficient response, there was only one patient out of 139 in the monotherapy arm, which is very similar to the STREAM study. And then the patients who added DMARDs, which clearly added DMARDs because they weren't doing as well, only two patients withdrew. So very few withdrew because of lack of efficacy. There were three deaths in the monotherapy group and one in the DMARD group but none of these were considered related to treatment. Uh, some were lost to follow-up, uh, some refused treatment, and uh, some had administrative reasons why they were taken out of the protocol. Uh, for example, one of my patients had a spindle cell cancer in the skin, and while she was doing extremely well on treatment, the protocol said she had to be removed from the study. So in total, it looks like the main thing leading to withdrawal over time was adverse events. If we look at when DMARDs were added, this is the next slide. Uh, in the protocol, you weren't allowed to add DMARDs within six months, but somehow some of the investigators managed to do this. Uh, and then the majority had them added shortly after the end of the six month double blind period and very few were added after 30 weeks. Uh, what DMARDs were added? Well, generally it was methotrexate, but a small percentage had hydroxychloroquine, leflunamide, or parenteral gold added. And it's my, been my experience that adding methotrexate to monotherapy often led to abnormal liver function tests and makes me reluctant to do that in clinical practice. Patients who had prior methotrexate experience there was no association between that and people who then had a DMARD added. The next slide shows a figure of toxicity, uh, and this is figure five in the poster if you've got access to this. I think this is a useful figure because what it does is show when the events occurred during the period of open label. And what you can see from this is that there's, there's really no tendency for any of the adverse events to increase over time. In fact, the infections seem a bit more common in the first half of the five years rather than the second half, and that's reflected in the fact that rates are a little bit lower later in the study. Uh, there's no trend with cardiac disorders and really no trend with cancer or any other things we'd be concerned about long term. So the long-term safety looked very reassuring uh, with this agent. So the conclusions from this study is that 57% of patients in am from ambition remained on tocilizumab monotherapy with durable efficacy over time. There was no association between baseline methotrexate experience and addition or no addition of a DMARD. However, the proportion of patients withdrawing for adverse events was higher in those who added DMARDs than in those who remained on monotherapy. And lastly, there was no obvious associations between serious adverse events and duration of tocilizumab, and no new safety signals were detected. So what are the implications of this for practice? Well, these data really enforce the view that tocilizumab and maybe tofacitinib it's a biological DMARD of choice where monotherapy is required. And unlike other biological DMARDs, adding a traditional DMARD to tocilizumab doesn't add much in terms of efficacy and doubles the risk of adverse events. 
So we need to change our mindset and not consider that tocilizumab is similar to the anti-TNFs, that we may need to actually uh, modify this and think about it more as a preferred monotherapy agent. The efficacy of tocilizumab monotherapy appears to peak about 18 months, so a prolonged trial may be necessary in some patients, and certainly I've got people where the biochemical improvements occur early, like the CRP or the ESR, but it has been 12 to 18 months where I've seen full clinical response. Clinical trial infection rates are lower than post-marketing studies uh, based on Japanese results, uh, and in fact, infection rates seem to double in post-marketing. So I believe we need caution is necessary, particularly in those with high infection risk. This includes the elderly, the frail person with an in infection history, people with diabetes mellitus, and people on corticosteroids. And if you look in the phase three clinical trial program, all of these factors, but not neutropenia, were the ones that increased infection risk and I'm reluctant to give it to people on corticosteroids, particularly if they've got diabetes. One of the things that remains uncertain with tocilizumab is whether we can withdraw it or decrease the dose if people are doing very well. We know with the anti-TNF agents that with rare exceptions, we can't withdraw them. For example, with the tenocept, we can halve the dose in people on remission and do okay. With tocilizumab, there's really a lack of evidence totally about what we can do in a withdrawal situation. My clinical experience has been that people do tend to flare usually in two to three, within two to three months of cessation. So I've been reluctant to stop altogether. However, I do have a number of patients where I've followed the atenocept like process and I've halved the dose. So I've gone from the eight milligram per kilo dose. And then if people are doing well after six to 12 months and they're in remission, I've dropped down to four milligrams per kilo. I freely admit, however, that there is no data that drives this particular process, but it seems to work in my practice. I'd caution against using the approach that's standard in America, where you start with four milligrams per kilo, and if they don't do well, you build up to eight, because that's been shown to increase the frequency of developing uh, inactivating antibodies and increases the risk of getting severe anaphylactic response. So I don't believe that's a, a particularly good evidence-based approach. But going the other way does make more sense. In terms of dropouts of patients in, in the long-term study, the only difference between the group who dropped out and those who didn't was adverse events. And the only predictor of this was actually adding another non-biologic DMARD to the tocilizumab therapy. Uh, apart from this, there were actually no differences between the groups and certainly no difference in terms of loss of efficacy because that was only a very small proportion of the 243 patients. So it seems that once patients respond to this treatment, it's very durable in terms of long-term efficacy. And I have people now who are up to seven or eight years on tocilizumab who are in the long-term extension who are still doing well with no evidence of active disease.